Okay, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining me um, in this unusual setting because of the strike. Um, yeah, but we just see how it goes. And if you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself. Okay, so I would like to come back to something we discussed about two weeks ago, um, which is the notion of a planar graph and kind of generalize it from uh, what we know by now. So what we have done in the past, whatever, two weeks, was to discover the main theorem, the classification of surfaces. Uh, remember that was this classification and the classification results essentially said that the surface is equivalent to uh, three numbers that are called D, P, and T, the number of boundary points, the number of projective planes, and the number of um, tori. And that's a pretty cool result. And now we know essentially everything we want to know about surfaces. So we are good to go on, I guess. Um, and a nice idea, as we will see, is to play a little bit around with the Euler characteristic and now to play around with the knowledge that we gained from uh, studying surfaces. Okay, and what I will do is, and this will take us a while, but we'll just start with the planar graphs anyway. So what I will do is I will generalize planar graphs such that they will live on surfaces and we will have some fun with planar graphs on surfaces. So as a reminder, so here's a, here's a, uh, here's a graph. Um, so this is a planar embedding of a graph, whatever, some vertices, some edges, but not everything is planar, right? So I did, just me moving the vertex, of course, doesn't really change the abstract graph, but it changed the projection of the graph. So as you can see, some of them, this one is not planar, this one is planar and so on. So it really depends on um, kind of the properties of our embedding. Um, but note that this whole picture here that you see is essentially flat. So essentially it lives on a disk. And remember that I kind of tried to sell this idea that the surface is nothing else than a generalization of a disk. Um, so certainly we can draw those things on surfaces as well on kind of an arbitrary surface. You can imagine that this happens on a torus or something. Uh, so when I, it's not a torus in this case. So if I pull out my edge here uh, on a torus, it will come in here again. Um, but this is just a plain picture. But anyway, you can imagine probably how it works. So let me move this picture again out of the way. And the planar graph was what I just showed you with the one catch that not every realization is planar. Well, remember that I just moved the vertices around and clearly that changes the property of uh, the graph, of the embedding of the graph being planar or not. Okay, and I want to do the same for an arbitrary surface. We now understand arbitrary surfaces very well. As I said, it's just the main theorem. So we, we actually know what they are. They are uh, spheres with some decorations like handles, uh, boundary points or projective planes. So we can, easily imagine drawing a graph on a surface. And that's what we will do. And I only need two technical notions. It's not very important, but to be completely precise, I want to know what a pass is. So a pass here is on my surface. Here's my surface is uh, from X to Y. Here's X, here's Y is some mapping of the interval that I can just run like whatever goes down here, goes back such that I start here at zero and I end here at one. So that's just um, a pass in the surface, um, just goes from X to Y, such that you should think of it as time. So we start at zero and we end at Y, but it's just really just a pass. It's just really a line that you can continuously draw. So continuous just means I can draw it without, uh, well, lifting my pen. Um, and that's just what it is. And then I say, well, Okay, we have all paths. And in any surface, the graph is the following. So we associate uh, vertices to some points here. Here's a vertex, here's a vertex, here's a vertex, whatever. And we associate edges to some paths such that we will see it in a, in a second the conditions here. But of course, it's such that uh, the start and the end of a vertex correspond to the, uh, well, the adjacent edges of the vertex, uh, of, the, of the edge. Um, so here's another one, and maybe we can do it this way, like this. So this is a graph uh, on a torus, and here are the conditions now spelled out. So we want it to be injective. It should be an analog of a planar graph. So there's no strange, well, let me draw another picture for you. There's no strange kind of 
crossing. Uh, so here are two vertices, and here's maybe an edge, maybe in blue. No strange crossings of the edges. And it's really just, uh, so the edge is just a pass in the surface, such that, well, the starting point is uh, whatever, V and the endpoint is W. And you only intersect at the endpoints. That's exactly the point. And this is really just a technical way I draw it again of saying um, that we just draw we just draw a graph uh, in our uh, surface and we just don't do it in any silly way. So it really lives on the surface. And what we can do this, for example, we can go around, go out here again or something like that. It's really a generalization of planar graph and I call it a graph on a surface. Also, this would be a graph on a torus, a bit harder to imagine, but in principle, what you should do is you should think of our polygon decompositions. Um, and then, well, it's, it's not so hard to imagine. So this was a torus and a graph on a torus is now just a collection of vertices here. And we can just draw edges as usual, um, but if we can also draw it along the torus, something like this and something like whatever this. Right, so and we could do this for any polygon decomposition. Right? So this just surfaces polygon decompositions, and on the polygon decomposition, it might not be so hard to imagine. Um, keep in mind that well, projective plane is a bit hard to visualize, but for example, it's um, polygon is fairly simple. So graphs on projective planes are essentially no problem. Okay, and I want to start with the following observation. And this is kind of the starting point for everything we will do until Friday. Um, so the following are equivalent. There's a graph embedding in R2, and that's what I called was planar. There's a graph embedding in D2 in the disk. And the main important one, there's a graph embedding in S2, the sphere. So uh, the, the plane from viewpoint of graph embeddings, the disk and the sphere are essentially the same. And we can call all of them, all of them planar graphs because the following are equivalent. Um, it's just a little bit strange because in this case, a planar graph will live on a sphere, right? Here's a sphere and our planar graph will be something like whatever, a triangle. And here it's really just a triangle in a plane, but it's the same kind of information. And how do you see that this is the same kind of information? Well, let me first argue that those two are the same. That's really easy to see because a graph is finite. So you can always just cut out a big enough disk and it lives on the disk and other way around is, uh, well, the disk lives in R2. Okay, so the only thing we need to establish is actually this one here um, between the disk and the sphere. But this is also not so hard if you think about it. So if you have a disk, the disk just can be just put on the sphere, uh, done. And if we have it on the sphere, that the only thing in, that we really need to do is we need to think of the sphere as, well, this, this um, wrapped up surface here where the plane was at the bottom and we had this map from the sphere to the plane which was exactly the stereographical projection and as long as we move g is finite so we can move it away from from infinity and then we get some so here would be our graph somewhere and then we get the projection down down here somewhere and certainly i want better colors maybe something in green um, so we just would, would get the little projection so from here projected okay this was a really bad picture it gets much much bigger let me try it actually um so it gets much much bigger here just the scaled version of the graph uh, on the plane surface and why is this great well we already like planar graphs a lot or I hope at least we like planar graphs a lot and now we can think of them as living on a sphere and we have studied spheres quite a lot and any other surface is built out of spheres. So any other graph is essentially some higher version, if you want, of a planar graph. Okay, any graph, a planar graph is equivalent to a graph on a sphere. We're just moving it away from infinity. Okay. Um, and what we would like to do is we would like to use some combinatorics of this picture. And let's assume we have an a uh, graph on a surface. Let me just click a little bit through. So the faces are the connected components. So here's an example in the disk or equivalently on the sphere or equivalently in R2. And the faces are all of these guys here. So one, two, three, four. Here's another one, one, two, three, 
for a node that the outside is a face because it's a connected component of our surface. So you always count the outside as well. Right? The rule here always count the outside as well. Uh, note that these two graphs have the same uh, number of faces in both projections. And that's not a coincidence. That's true in general. And we'll see uh, later that is actually true in general. But a priori, that must not be, it's not really clear why, uh, no matter how you draw your graph, you always have the same number of faces. Um, and this is true for any surface. Maybe let me try to draw something on a torus, but instead of using the torus that I was just attempting to draw, let's let us use the polygon decomposition of a torus. Um, and you can, for example, have a graph that looks like whatever. Here's a loop, and here's an edge, and maybe here's another edge. Cool. So here is a face. Um, here is a face, but note that this face here continues here, because if we go out here, we come in here, this face here continues here as well by the same rule. And this face continues then all the way up to here. So this graph actually on the torus has only two faces. One of them is stuck in the loop, right? And the other one is this blue one that goes all the way around the surface. And it makes sense for any, for any surface. So if you want to draw a graph on a projective plane, go for it. Um, that's just what you do. And we think of them as being in a disk, as I said, oh, this is a really bad resolution. So we think of them as being in a disk where we really just count uh, the number of faces of the disk. And that's why you count the outside face as well, right? It's a, this is this connected component of this complement. So the complement is just to take out the graph uh, from whatever kind of surface you have. Okay, that's a face of embedded graphs. It only makes sense for embedded graphs. So we need to fix an embedding of a graph to make that work. But as soon as you have that, you can talk about faces. So in this case, you have four faces in general, whatever, whatever the number of faces is. So in our Taurus example, uh, we had two faces. Okay. Um, and well, what I would like to tell you now is what is very crucial here and where we can now then use all the funny tricks we already learned from surfaces. So let's say we have we don't have a tree. Trees are a little bit special. Trees are just kind of a little bit silly if you think of them as living on a uh, on a sphere. So now we have S two here as an underlying surface. They don't really do anything. They just sit there. And well, they still have one face, the outside face. But anyway, they just sit there. So let's ignore them. So any other, and I will draw a picture in a second. Any other graph gives a polygon decomposition of S2. So that's what we like. We have polygon decompositions. We know them. And graphs gives us polygon decompositions. As long as they're not trees, trees are a little bit boring. Let me draw a picture for you. So as soon as we have something that is not a tree, let's say a triangle, we have a triangle on the sphere, then we get an inside polygon here uh, representing this little piece of the sphere. And we get this outside polygon um, just from the outside, which kind of does the opposite. Um, and the point is, we can just identify the non-trivial cycles in G. Right? There will be some, some G, here's some G, and it will have some, some nonsense going on, whatever. And every non-trivial cycle, like this one, will bound a face of S2, which is my background in this picture. And you just make it work by it essentially, you just make it work by staring at the picture that I just draw here. Anyway, um, so the point here is that we get a polygon decomposition by looking at graphs on the sphere. And that's why I wanted this theorem, right? So here, planar graphs are graphs on spheres. And we get polygon decompositions for them. So we can play our usual polygon games with planar graphs, which I personally find is Pretty cool, actually. So planar graphs and polygons, polygon decompositions are essentially the same in some way. Okay. And using that theorem, we can now prove that the number of faces of any planar embedding is always the same because, um, well, it is a polygon decomposition of the sphere. So the Euler characteristic should be fixed. The Euler characteristic should always be two. We will give an example in a second. 
and the number of vertices is fixed. Of course, it depends only on the graph. The number of edges is fixed. So if this number is fixed, this number is fixed, and this number is fixed, well, this number needs to be fixed as well. So that's why we always have the same number here, sorry, here, of faces uh, in any planar embedding of a graph, right? Because yeah, it's a polygon decomposition. For polygon decompositions, we know that the Euler characteristic is an invariant, it's fixed. So um, vertices, edges are, of course, the same. And then the number of faces must be. So let me convince you that this, in this case actually works. So we want two equals number of vertices minus number of edges plus number of faces. Uh, so let's see. Number of vertices, I guess, is four. N number of edges is uh, six. Uh, so two must be four minus six plus question mark. So question mark better has to be four as well, uh, right? Just, just very, very simple calculation. And indeed we see four faces, so it actually works out. So four minus six plus four is our magical formula for the, in this case, the Euler characteristic of a plane graph. Okay, um, that's pretty exciting. So in particular, calculating the Euler characteristic of a plane graph is a little bit, well, the wrong thing to do because we know that the answer needs to be two. What is way better is that we can now play with the three numbers, with the three numbers that we have, because they satisfy a relation. They satisfy a relation two equals the number of vertices minus number of edges plus number of faces, which is pretty good. So we will use that, and it's really beautiful um, to show, for example, that certain graphs are not planar and do other funny things on soccer balls. And this is really easy. Um, I just uh, have to prove here that I skip it and rather want to show you uh, the proposition that K5 is not planar. So we had K5 and I claimed that it is not planar, but I couldn't give you a proof exactly because of this nonsense here that um, just because one embedding doesn't work doesn't mean that another one, right? This one, we had this one and this one maybe works and who knows actually, um, and you need to find some argument to rule out that there's some crazy movement of the vertices, right? You can do some crazy stuff here, um, such that eventually your graph gets planar. So let me just do this here. If I would start with this drawing of the graph, I mean, it doesn't seem to be very clear whether it's planar or not. So to check that a graph is planar is actually not so trivial. Um, you need to write it down, but to check, you need to really find a, an embedding. But to check that the graph is not planar is actually even harder because we need to rule out that there is some very smart movement of the of the vertices um, such that it actually gets planar eventually. Oh, there you go. It is planar again. So that's not a really that's really a non-trivial theorem, or maybe I call it a proposition or whatever, but it's actually not so hard by what we know now. And this is how it always works, okay? This is a trick how you always do it. Um, so we assume that it is planar. We assume that it's planar and we will contradict that assumption. So we have a certain number of faces and we will use, we assume it's planar, so it has some faces and we will use this one here to contradict that this is actually possible. Okay, and that's really simple. So we know the number of vertices, we know the number of edges, I mean, just count, obviously. And we know that this, this, this equation would need to hold. So we just solve uh, 5 minus 10 plus x needs to be 2. So if I haven't miscalculated, then uh, a number of faces in any planar projection of this graph would have been 7. Um, but you can actually see the following. So every face has at least three edges in this projection. You can already see it here. So one, two, three, so every face has at least three edges in any projection. So you can use actually the degree face equation to see that twice the number of edges must be the sum of all of the degrees of the faces, which is at least three times the number of faces. So twice the number of edges needs to be bigger than three times the number of faces. And well, twice 10 and three times seven exactly doesn't work out. So we get a contradiction which shows that K, the K5 cannot be planar. So, okay, let me repeat the argument. In order to see that this is not planar, we assume it is and use 
the Euler characteristic to, to get some numerical co uh, counter example, uh, numerical um, contradiction here. So in particular, we just calculate the number of faces in such a planar projection needs to be seven. We think about it a little bit. Um, every face needs to have three edges by if you're just staring at the graph. So the face degree equation looks like two times the number of edges should be the sum of the degrees of the faces, which should be, well, because everything at least needs three, should be big O equal to three times F. Um, this is 10, this one is 10, this one is seven. Uh, two times 10 is uh, not bigger than three times seven. So we get a contradiction and well, that's it. That's a pretty cool proof. So it uses really just some numerics of the Euler characteristic. That's it. And we get this by, well, from what we know now about surfaces because planar graphs give polygon decompositions of surfaces. So the complete graph is not planar by an Euler characteristic argument. So I call these type of arguments Euler characteristic arguments because essentially they're just playing with the Euler characteristic. That's pretty cool. That's actually pretty cool. Um, and we can now deduce what I wanted to do in one of the first lectures. So the complete graph is planar if and only if, well, n is one up to four. And we already seen planar embeddings of uh, the complete graphs. Well, complete graph one, complete graph. I just draw a complete graph number four. So with four vertices, this is this one here. Um, so four vertices, this is a really bad picture. Four vertices uh, and six edges. And here's a planar projection of it. For K3, it's even simpler. K3 is just this one. Uh, for K2, it's even simpler. And whatever K1 is, doesn't really matter. It definitely works. But for K5, we know by the previous proposition that it doesn't work. But now K5 is a sub of Kn for all bigger n. So uh, it can't work. Because if we would have found a planar embedding of K512, then this would imply that we have found a K planar embedding of K5, which I think is a pretty cool way to wrap up what we have seen in the first, uh, first few lectures, maybe it was the second lecture, where it really wasn't clear how to show this statement at all. And now we just can use the OLAC characteristic trick to uh, show that the complete graphs are essentially never planar, only for very small numbers of vertices, well, particularly anything below four. Okay, and we can do essentially the same with this one, uh, but that's something I will play around with in the tutorial eventually. So for now, uh, the proof of this is we play around with it in the tutorial. So here's another graph that is not planar, the K33 graph and the K5 graph uh, where's k5 k5 is somewhere here the k5 graph are not planar okay and we rule this out in essentially the same way just that in this case i postponed the proof to the tutorials because it's actually uh, pretty nice pretty nice okay so we have found two graphs that are more planar um and turns out that there's a theorem which which is really not easy to show but we are free to use it so I show it to you, which is called Kuratowski theorem, that a graph is planar if and only if it has no subdivision of the, those two types, which gives you an algorithm to check whether a graph is planar, because you essentially just have to check it for everything smaller. And whenever you hit this guy, or whenever you hit uh, this guy, it is not. And this is a pretty cool theorem, because first of all, it rules out for a given graph. If it's not planar, it will tell you immediately that it's not planar. And if it's planar, it doesn't find the planar embedding for you, but at least it tells you that uh, the graph is planar. It's a really complete theorem and very not, not very hard. It just, uh, it's a very complete theorem in the sense that it also contains the complete graphs. It's not very hard. Um, it's very hard to prove, but it's not very hard as a statement. It's really, really beautiful. So whenever you have, want to check planarity, the only obstruction sets, obstructions that you ever need to check are K33 and K5, which, as I said, is a pretty, pretty cool statement. And essentially, you get that from some, uh, again, some playing with those notions. Okay. Um, 
planar graphs. Uh, in particular, next week, we'll study planar graphs a lot, but then we look on of planar graphs on tori or on projective planes, Klein bottles, all that fun stuff. But for now, we just stay with S2. So the rest of the lecture, our good old fr uh, the friend here is S2, and we look at different polygon decompositions of S2, because for all of them, we actually get this magical equation that you really want to remember uh, the Euler characteristic if this equals two because two is the Euler characteristic. This was supposed to be an Euler characteristic of S2. So this was supposed to be a chi here, oh, a very bad chi. Uh, let me try again to make it, make it a better chi. Okay, so this is the Euler characteristic here, uh, whatever, <laughs> of S2. So two. And this is really a, a very important uh, fact that you use all the time, so that's why we want to remember it. Um, and the point is now the famous platonic solids are just, again, polygon decompositions of the sphere, so they will all satisfy this V minus E plus F uh, trick, game, fact, numerical coincidence. Okay, so platonic solids are the tetrahedron, the cube, the octahedron, the dodecahedron, and the isocahedron. And I just, well, did the computation here, or probably I just copied it from somewhere, but it's not really hard. Number of vertices, number of uh, edges, and number of faces, and observe that the alternating sum is always two. So uh, so this 12 minus 30 plus 20 is two. Uh, this one seems to be two as well. This one here is also two, very good. This one here is two, and this one here is two. And note the duality, so these were dual surfaces, and these were dual surfaces. And what duality does is exactly this trick here. It swaps uh, the number of, uh, in this case, it swaps the number of vertices and the number of edges. But note that the Euler characteristic is always invariant. And somewhere there should be a 20, I guess, uh, so that this swap actually uh, works out as well. So the number of vertices of the dodecahedron is 20, and the duality just swaps vertices and faces. And the number of edges, there was a question, the number of edges is actually fixed, and we can prove that now because we know that this uh, relation must be satisfied. So when we swap vertices and faces, um, the number of edges doesn't change. It needs to be fixed in order for this equation to work out. Okay. So here, all of these are polygon decompositions of the sphere, as you can literally see uh, from those pictures. Um, well, this one is probably the easiest to see, but anyway. Okay. Um, but the question I would like to answer with the Euler characteristic is, of course, a very well-known theorem that there are no other platonic solids. But I will prove that using the Euler characteristic, which is a very different argument then the old Greeks actually used to show that there are no um, other uh, platonic solids. So how can we do this? Well, so certainly we have a certain number of vertices, a certain number of edges, and a certain number of faces in our platonic solid. So we have a polygon decomposition of S2 by gluing together regular n goods. That's the whole point. So the restriction on the uh, um, platonic solid is that we don't glue together random, arbitrary um, polygons, but always regular n ones. So that a certain number of polygons meet at every vertex, right? So everything is regular. So around each vertex, it will always be the same number, and we call this number p. So we have n ones, and there will be p around each vertex. So each vertex has degree p. And because we have n ones, so there will be a face somewhere. So the number here is n. Each face has to be n. So we know vertices have to be p, faces have to be n. And that's exactly, I said again, why they are called platonic solids, because they have this restriction on being kind of locally always the same. They are only regular n ones glued together in a very precise manner. OK, in other words, we get this equality from the vertex degree equation, number of uh, degrees of the vertices is twice the degrees of the edges, but everything has degree p. So we get p times number of vertices is twice the number of edges. 
And similarly, we get from the phase de uh, degree equation exactly the same, but with the number of phases. Okay, so we have p times v is two times e, and n times f is two times e. So we can actually just again solve this equation, right? So we know every ingredient. We know this one here is just a multiple of e. So we will replace it momentarily. This one here is a multiple of e. So we will replace it momentarily, right? So there you go. So um, it's just this equation by just oops, getting it uh, sorted out by replacing this one by, um, what is it? V is 2E over P. So here's a minus E missing. V is 2E over P. Uh, F is uh, 2E over N. So this was V before, this was F before, and E stays what it is. And now we get two equals something, depending on P and N. We do algebra autopilot, put it on one side, and we get the equation that one plus P, one over P plus one over N. So P, the degrees of the vertices, N, the N-guns, has to be one over two plus one over number of E. So we don't know what number of E is, but we still get this equation just from playing with the order characteristic and playing with the various uh, degree equations that we had. Uh, but this is certainly bigger than one over two. I mean, it's one over two plus one over E. So it's certainly bigger than one over two. So we get this equation, which essentially just says this guy here is bigger than one over two. So how many numbers actually, one, one, one over P and one over N satisfy that this equation? Turns out not so many. You can actually just test that. If one of them is uh, too small, it actually doesn't really work anymore. So um, it follows, oops, it follows that actually from this equation, we can solve for P and N and I will do that on the next slide. So we, we would then also get the number of edges, but fine, and the number of vertices and the number of faces. But the point here is that we want to solve those guys for under these restrictions, and there are not so many options. So one over three plus one over three, for example, right? So the, the two lowest ones, um, that's two over three, which is certainly bigger than one over two. So this one actually checks out. But if I would use something like one over seven, like p equals seven plus one over six, whatever, n equals three, then this will be smaller than one over two. So seven and six, for example, don't work out. And you can easily rule out now all the cases, and this is a result. So the only possible ways to have one over p plus one over n smaller, uh, bigger than one over two, very simple check is, are those cases. So P uh, three, 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 four, three, five, uh, five, three, five, uh, th uh, four, three, five, three. And while well, you solve it and you get the usual uh, yoga for the um, platonic solids. But the point is, since these are the only possible solutions, right, for this equation, there cannot be any other platonic solid, right? The only complete list of platonic solids is given by those guys where, because we can restrict those numbers using this equation. So whenever you have already a one over six, no matter what you do, one over six plus one over three is the same as, uh, is, is the same as one over two. So this is not bigger than one over two. So this is exactly the boundary case it doesn't work out here anymore. So um, as, if, as soon as one of them is bigger than six, we are dead. So we end up with this list of platonic solids, which is a pretty cool way of doing it, actually. So uh, classifying platonic solids using the Euler characteristic. It's pretty cool, actually. Um, that's exactly what I said. I just have written it down. Again, the only thing that I haven't done here in this proof is, well, we, this proves that the only possible solutions are whatever those guys here, but it still doesn't prove that they exist. But of course, um, existence of the platonic solids is not so hard to prove. Well, it's kind of a well-known construction, but we still need, would need to verify that, right? The, we only get from the Euler characteristic that the only possible solutions are those five, but it doesn't mean they exist. But um, of course they do, 
platonic solids are one of the world's most studied surfaces uh, of all time. And well, here are the dice realizations of platonic solids. Um, probably the most famous dice is this one here, but you certainly, some of you might have seen the other dice as well. So well-known construction of the platonic solids. Cool. Um, and the symmetry here going to the dual surface, so let me just go to the dual surface again, is given by Pn to Np, so swapping this around. Um, and this corresponds to the, let's, let's look at the table again. So this one is self-dual, this one is dual to this one, and this one is dual to this one, right? Dodecahedron and isocahedron, as well as octahedron and the cube. And the tetrahedron is kind of special. It only likes itself, so it's uh, the self-dual object. And duality here is just given by swapping those two numbers, which is uh, pretty cool and kind of makes sense because one of them was uh, whatever was around the vertex, that was P, and the other one was whatever was around the face, that was N, and we swap faces and vertices under duality. Okay, so these are self-dual, these are dual, um, and these are dual as well. If you would do that, I just but we just did the count and uh, the numbers uh, swap accordingly. Um, so here, more surface, the more decompositions of the sphere, uh, different ones, these are not platonic solids. So this famous one here is hexagons, for example, and pentagons, but they're also just uh, surface decomposition, just uh, what is it, uh, polygon decompositions of, of S2. Again, this one here is a bit trickier. It has certain whatever gons and certain other whatever gons, um, but essentially um, these are, well, if you want it, this is just a, of course, just a pentagon as well. It just looks a little bit strange. You can just flatten it out here. And this one's a pentagon as well. And the other ones are, of course, hexagons. So um, so those are the two same de decompositions of soccer balls. And we can use all our characteristic tricks uh, to do that, actually. So here are more uh, platonic solid ball soccer balls, whatever you want to call them. Um, they're not platonic solids. They have two different types of faces, but they're totally legal uh, polyhedron decompositions of the sphere. And well, so let's say, let's say we want to build a soccer ball, which is not this one, but the, the combinatorics is a bit nicer, out of triangles and octagons. Well, so you want to build a soccer ball out of triangles and octagon, um, and we want to have some conditions on it, and we want to determine the number of triangles and octagons that we need. So is there any, any possible way of doing this? So if you have triangles somewhere and octagons uh, be pieced together in some way, it's, it's absolutely not clear. There might be a solution. There might be millions of solutions. Um, so not quite obvious how to attack this problem. Whenever you see such a question, what you're supposed to do is you need to scream in your head like, oh, Euler characteristic. So let's use the Euler characteristic. And again, you do the same and you solve for the Euler characteristic. And this is actually, I just did it here. Um, so if you pause later the video and just do the calculation yourself, you will end up with uh, this number of edges and this number of uh, vertices. And S and T are uh, supposed to be O and T, I guess, uh, the number of octagons and the number of triangles. So we have six octagons and eight triangles, and this is how they will arrange themselves uh, around the soccer ball, around the sphere. And you can ask the same question for all of them. For this one, you can calculate pentagons and hexagons or whatever, and you always get um, some results on the num possible number of octagons, triangles, whatever you use. So for example, in this case, you might have wondered why all of them always look the same. So this is just a different one, a different path, a different kind of art style maybe, but it's actually the same polygon decomposition. And they always look the same. They always have one hexagon and then three hexagons and three pentagons around. And this just again comes out if you do the Euler characters, the game, which is uh, what we will also do eventually. I just did it here for triangles and octagons 
just to highlight that you can really do it for anything you want, literally. And you get funny polygon decompositions of soccer balls. So in case you are up for designing uh, kind of uh, exotic soccer ball structures. Um, so, um, so that's just the octacube is this picture as before, just doing this doesn't show anything. It just shows that this is the only possible solution. It doesn't necessarily show that it exists, but um, here is a so-called octacube. You see the, uh, the octagons and the triangles here is actually a real polygon and it exists. And it is a soccer ball decomposition, a very strange one. Uh, I, I, know, I never saw this as, as a soccer ball, at least for uh, the sphere. And note again that the main point here is not that this exists. I mean, this is the only possible one. And then you just construct it. So this is the only possible one, possible um, way to glue triangles and octagons together to get a sphere. And similarly, I repeat myself here, there's also only one way to draw hexagons and pentagons together. And that's why all soccer balls always look the same because there's just one way. And how do you verify it? By an Euler characteristic argument. Okay, so and it's really not hard to just cut off the corners of a cube if you want. So the construction, if you take the cube, so this is cube here, I guess, and you would cut off the corners to get the triangles. You cut off the corners and you get those little triangles here. So cut out eight corners, the three, four, five, six, seven, eight, which is what I claimed here, eight corners and six of the other ones because, well, six, it's the cube, right? So you just have six of those uh, faces. I iterate myself, I stress again, that the point is that the Euler characteristic argument, which we learned from the surface decompositions, uh, shows that this is the only possible solution. A priori, I don't know, there could be one million trillion solutions to glue octagons or triangles together into a soccer ball, but there's exactly one, right? And here again, there's exactly one to draw, uh, to glue uh, pentagons and hexagons together. So that's why all well, the soccer balls always look uh, the same. It's really cute, right? So really cute argument actually. Um, and this was actually what I wanted to talk about today. So next time we go to uh, some colorings and then we play more with graphs, but essentially what we did today is that we repeat, uh, we um, used polygon decompositions of spheres. And for the sphere, there's a crucial equation that two is equal to the number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces. It's always the same. And it leads to the following crucial results, which you try to, can try to remember because they're actually pretty good. So um, for this was the, the whole thing about uh, platonic solids. But for planar graphs, we can actually decide whether graphs are planar by using an Euler characteristic trick. Yeah, yeah Euler characteristic trick by just rearranging the formulas um, because every planar graph will satisfy this formula, which, let me iterate that again, also shows that the number of faces of a planar graph is always the same, no matter how you draw it, which is absolutely not obvious. Let me just pull up the example again. So um, here's a planar version. It has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine faces. But who tells me that anything else I would do um, if I can manage something different here? Probably I can't. But if I would be able to manage something different, it will always also have the same number of faces. And it all, all comes from our main theorem, because our main theorem tells us that the sphere always satisfies this equation. And I think that's pretty cool, actually. And this is such a widespread application of the, the very same formula. You can use it to classify platonic solids, which is what we did next. The platonic solid is just a polygon decomposition of a sphere in a certain way. And we used it to classify them by an Euler characteristic argument, which gave us this equation. No, sorry, this equation here. And in solving the equation, it's not very hard. Well, up to, you still need to construct them at construction is not, also not very hard. And you can go on, do some funny games with literally any polygon decomposition, like soccer balls of uh, the S2, 
and I say it again because it's pretty cool. Uh, it never crossed my mind before I learned about this, but all the soccer balls look the same, and there's a reason for it because the Euler characteristic argument, actually, that I spelled out here for triangles and octagons, will give us that the number of um, hexagons is fixed and the number of uh, pentagons is also fixed, and they're also glued together in a precise way. So there's only one solution to gluing, uh, building out a soccer ball out of hexagons and pentagons, and that's the one you always see uh, in, well, real life, I guess. Uh, so wherever you see, uh, what is it, soccer balls. And I did this with um, the this kind of, kind of thing, the octa cube, which is just exactly the same in case you ever want to build a soccer ball out of triangles and octagons. And you can do the same game with anything you want, literally, whatever you want to build out a, I don't know, a soccer ball out of 12 guns and four guns, um, it will tell you some solution to this question. Uh, so the main point for today was really just this uh, equation. Anyway, thank you very much and see you tomorrow.